Potentially, yes. That has been an issue that has been written about. Like you scratch some skin off of a celebrity and go to a lab. And I mean, I mean, I think that's more of a science fiction thing, but potentially, yeah. This is the Rose Woman Podcast, provocations for living whole, happy, and free your whole life long. I'm Christine Marie Mason, your host, founder, philosopher, author, mama yogi, basically a human who's interested in helping women love their bodies more, especially their sensual and sexual lives, and live in more peace and purpose and power. So welcome to episode 30. That's a nice round number, right? Thanks for being with me on this journey from Taboo to Liberation, and especially thank you to those of you who are sharing and reviewing and subscribing. I know there's so much content to choose from, and I super appreciate you choosing this show. After a month of sexuality episodes, today's the beginning of a four-week series of new takes on the family, and we are starting with a mind-blowing conversation on reproductive tech, how it's already changed us, even though it might be invisible, and what's on the horizon with Rachel Lehman Haupt. A little over 40 years ago, the first IVF baby was born. Do you remember that? They called her Louise Brown, the first test tube baby. It was so astonishing, and now here we are today talking about networks of half-siblings from sperm donors, or having a baby with three parents, or creating babies from skin cells, parthenogenesis, and how all of that impacts our cultural concepts of family and personal choices. What does it mean to be kin anyway? Considering kids today is a whole different game, and Rachel and I start by talking about what's changed. People will now put vaccination, vaccinated on their dating site. I got my first invitation this week to come if you're vaxxed. Yeah, exactly. I think that this was a year of a lot of people turning inward and, and, and now all the work we've done about, you know, inward work will let us turn outward. And for those of us that, you know, are thinking about dating again, it's a good time. So here we are, our early 21st century so much has changed since I dated 20, 30, I don't even, I'm not even going to tell you how many decades ago, but a lot has changed in the culture. Like from the time that I had my first child to now, the average age of motherhood has gone from 22 to 29 and a half. There are other statistics like that. We have all of these new emergent technologies that are out there. How would you articulate the environment that someone who's thinking about having a family uh, is falling into? Like what's changed? What's what's out there? Well, I think a lot has changed and it's mostly driven by the fact that women are getting educated and having children older and men, but you know, men don't have as uh, impatient biological clock as women. And so, you know, we are getting to be the point where we often are not getting married until the pr- our prime fertile years or and, and, you know, that's creating new options. So I would think, say the biggest, you know, change is the fact that there are just so many more choices and more roots, which is a good thing, but it can, you know, also be a, a challenging thing when, you know, you don't know. Um, I mean, one only needs to look at, you know, a dating site to see how many different romantic and commitment categories there are now. And, you know, couple that with, you know, gender fluidity. And, you know, we're really, I think, coming into the age of what I'm calling family fluidity, uh, where there are a lot of different kinds of families now. Um, You know, people are meeting on websites that are for co-parents. They don't want to meet to date or fall in love. They want to meet to have a baby together. Women, including myself, you know, are having children on their own as single moms by choice. And, meeting their partners later who could go on and adopt the children that they had. You know, women are freezing their eggs and planning to have do in vitro fertilization once they meet their partner and, you know, are having kids well into their 40s, sometimes even their late 40s and early 50s. So you have, this is a, just even the combination of those things, more romantic commitment categories, more gender fluidity, more technical options for delaying parenthood to, until you're ready, or possibly even outsourcing parenthood, which I'm sure we're going to get into, um, has produced a whole set of new options. Uh, and that's confusing. Yeah, I think it's confusing. I think, I mean, there've always been 
people who are gay or single women, you know, but it's just that tends to have been more marginalized. And, you know, the the idea of the man and woman um, having two children or the nuclear family sort of has been this, you know, ideal or, you know, moral ideal even if it has ne was never actually really the case. Um, but the nuclear family, you know, that we sort of think of in the, in the 1950s, you know, like the Ozzie and Harriet family, you know, is, is dwindling. It's, it's, it make, it's less than 25% of the nation now. Um, and what's being replaced by that is all these new choices. So, you know, when you graduate from college, there's no um, sort of conformist path to follow anymore. Well, a lot of cultural institutions and governmental institutions are still stuck, though, in that era of the nuclear family. And so there's a sense of a mismatch, like your your tax structure is designed around the nuclear family, your visitation in the hospital is designed around that. I mean, all of these, your, your daycare, there's just so many things that are structured for that old model that we haven't caught up to. Weddings, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you have a new roles in a traditional wedding? It all has to be recreated if you're bringing in children from multiple marriages. And, you know, the relationship of step parenting or co-parenting um, has a, a whole new set of guidelines to it. So how are we navigating the cultural uh, anarchy that comes as a result of these changes? And, you know, how, how do you see us, are we able to catch up? Will we be able to catch up? Yeah, I mean, that's the subject of the, the, the new book that I'm working on and a series of articles that I'm, that I'm working on for Jane Metcalf's magazine, Neolife. And I think that, you know, there a lot of policy has to change. You know, President Biden, you know, obviously in the Trump era, it was a disaster because so much, you know, was being trying to be turned back to focus on the nuclear family. And, and I think President Biden is has his heart and strategy in the right place. You know, it really all falls down to childcare, the way that the childcare system is set up really does, puts, you know, single parents at, at a disadvantage. And also, you know, the traditional nuclear family, the, the mo more of the domestic labor still falls on to women. Um, so that, you know, creates, we don't have the infrastructure yet in policy, in attitude that, you know, really supports these alternatives, um, which, you know, can remain marginalized, but, you know, it's not, it's a plurality now of, of family choices. So yes, you know, we, we need to invent, you know, new policy, new ritual, new words to include all of these families. I remember, you know, I was a stepmother and the only model for being a stepmother was sort of the Cinderella type of stepmother. So we, we started calling it the fairy stepmother at that point. And, you know, that you're coming in with sort of godmother-like gifts. Um, but I do think it's really interesting. Like I never knew what to call my daughter's mother, who was very part of our life, you know, was she, was she my sister wife? Was she my husband's ex? Was she my daughter's mother? I mean, we had a relationship. So you're right, I think, even about terminology. I remember talking to you, and you were telling me about uh, your particular situation and sort of how you had non non traditional conception and the new family model that's emerged from in your world. Would, would you tell our listeners about that? Sure. Um, you know, I had Alexander, my son, uh, who's now eight, um, as a single mom by choice with an open identity sperm donor. So I, you know, learned a lot about him, and Alexander will have the option when he turns 18 to meet him if he wants. Uh, you know, this man is never going to be his father or dad in the traditional sense. Um, I always thought that, you know, I would find a man that, you know, would be my partner and possibly become his father or dad. As, you know, as I've been dating over the years, I found out that, you know, there are a number of other families through the sperm bank um, that used the same donor as I did. And they have, a, not only is the donor open identity, but those families um, are also open identity. So, you know, about a year ago, Alexander started getting curious. And so we reached out to 
those families through the sperm bank. And it turns out that there was a Facebook page all dedicated to kids and family and parents that used the same sperm donor. And I connected in with them. And unbeknownst to me, many of them not only live in the Bay Area, but also had been connected for many years, like since the kids were small. And I was sort of late to the game, which was surprising, but very much welcomed into this group who has, you know, gatherings. They had did a gathering. The, the, the kids are known as um, donor siblings or doses. So they had, you know, a gathering a few every couple of years um, called Dosi Palooza. And, and, you know, they're real friends. I, you know, have now become friends with a couple of the moms and you know throughout the pandemic we, we we really couldn't get together in person but one of the moms in the group did a regular sunday zoom where she would give you know an art project and then the kids would all meet on zoom and connect and and you know there have always been a, a source of support uh this one mom that did the art program when we had the blackouts here uh last you know at the beginning of i guess it was 2019 she you know, she wrote me and she said, do you need, you know, do you need my refrigerator? Do you need anything? Um, you know, I'm here to help. Another time, another one of the moms in the group, I was talking to her, texting with her, and I told her that I had had food poisoning and I was in bed that day. And she said, let me come up and take your son out for the day so you can rest. So there really is a, a sense of community and a support system. And that's kind of what a family is. And, you know, some of them have partners, you know, that they've met along the line. Some of them are still single. Some, a couple of them are, are, are lesbians. So they've been together throughout the whole thing. They just obviously needed a donor, sperm donor. But yeah, it feels like a modern family. That's just, it's totally fascinating. I'm moved by the way people's hearts open at any tenuous connection, much less a biological connection that says we are family and how you can make that decision and begin to treat each other in that way. But also like thinking about the doses and what an amazing opportunity that is to study the question of nature versus nurture. Yeah, I, I think that the question of nature versus nurture is really interesting. You know, they I, there's an unbelievable resemblance between them. They also all share a lot of similar qualities, like an interest in science. And I'll say that what is great is that Alexander is an only child, my son. So he actually isn't an only child. He has six half siblings out there that are in different, you know, families, but he are genetic relatives and he will have access to them his whole life and have the option to form his relationships. So that gives me a lot of, you know, a lot of security knowing that there are are going to be kids that grow up, that he grows up with that are his genetic relatives that, you know, are kind of like cousins or kind of, you know, like friends. But you know, what is very interesting is one of the, one of the things that I'm working on right now for this book is I, I want it to really set this whole world in context. And so I did a lot of historical research or I've been working on a historic, his chapter about, you know, you know, the history of family sort of very briefly, you know, very brief overview, but, um, you know, through the ages. And the idea of kin is not, has not traditionally or always been genetic. It has been genetic and non-genetic. And you can look in, you know, Aboriginal cultures or in Black and Latino cultures where, the non-genetic kin have real roles like you know black families um, refer to other mothers which are the non-genetic moms that help moms often single moms you know get by in life and act as sort of you know godparents and godparents play a very big role in latin culture latinx culture for example and that goes back to you know a time when you know we really did live in tribes and I think the nuclear family, as we see it, is actually a very new concept historically. And also, you know, it's it's a hard concept because this concept that, you know, this fiefdom of, of, of a mom and a dad and two kids can, I think, be a little bit isolating. And I think that, you know, the idea that 
that's the support and that there isn't this greater world, genetic and non-genetic out there, that can also act as a support is, is equally important in this day and age. Kin making and family fluidity are such great terms to describe how we form our bonds and what keeps us together. And I do agree with you that that nuclear family was an aberration. And it wasn't just because of moral changes. It was because people just died a lot more, you know? And you were left with fatherless children and motherless children and brothers and uncles. And, you know, the family fluidity was real, that you had that we had to take each other in because life was sort of less predictable, I guess, in a way. So I think you are right. We're standing on a tribal history when we reclaim that. Can we rewind a little bit and let's go into the technology stuff? Your, your comp- like just being able to have a sperm donor, what was it, or the early 80s? Yeah, I mean, artificial insemination, you know, or IUI, which is in inner uterine insemination, where they actually have a tube and they, you know, put it, the sperm directly into your uterus. Is, I think it was, in, you know, invented in the 80s. And, and, and there's so, an IVF you know, in, in the eighties, you know, which is, you know, creating a baby in a Petri dish and then, you know, now egg freezing and putting the eggs on ice. So, you know, you can unfreeze them and, and use IVF. I mean, basically there is an entire technology dedicated to creating babies without, you know, traditional sex now. Does that have a name? Is that called like conception tech or something like that? Is it a particular category? <laughs> it's, it's like, I, you know, reproductive technology. I mean, I one of the terms that I really like a lot, which is a lawyer named John Robertson coined it, it's called collaborative reproduction. Um, and it's, you know, the idea that, you know, with the opening up of marriage to um, same sexes and with the opening up of, you know, fertility to uh, single sexes, you know, single people, and also with, you know, bringing in surrogates and egg donors or sperm donors who actually have an open identity and can meet, it, it takes reproduction into this realm that is more collaborative. It's a fantastic term. It's almost like, like I, I also, I, I also coined the term like a reproductive sharing economy. Ah, interesting. Well, you've, you've got the collaboration um, between people who are sort of not coming together in traditional ways, and you also have the collaboration with science and research that you're sort of saying, hey, we're going to take the extension of our natural conception ability and collaborate with these sort of lab-driven technology. So I like that it goes in, in multiple directions, the social collaboration and the cross-channel collaboration. Do you ever have any concerns about you know, sort of natural selection being bypassed and what that does to the human gene pool with these technologies? It's a a really um, good question. And there are books being written about that now. You know, uh, we're in the age of the Anthropocene now, which is the idea that it's human-driven evolution. Um, And, you know, that is, look look, look what we've, we're wreaking havoc on the earth because of that and causing climate change. I mean, there are technologies out there that are going to change the gene pool. I mean, a specific technology is, there are two that, you know, is um, three-parent IVF, which is the idea that the mitochondria of a younger woman's egg is put into an older woman's egg that is, you know, she's, you know, her egg is not working because she's older or infertile and then fertilized with sperm. And therefore there are three gene lines in that baby. So yeah, I mean, that's question, you know, questioning. Um, The other thing is, is there's a new technology called IVG, which is in vitro gameotosis, which is that you can turn, you know, any cell in your body into a sperm or egg cell. That is is not to, you know, bringing in three genes, but it definitely is, you know, changing genetics. And especially if you think about the fact that it may be able to let somewhere down the line, I mean, we're not, I've, I've written a story about this, but uh, called same sex reproduction, which is, but, but the potential with gene editing mixed in that a man and a man or a woman and a woman could have a baby together, which would, again, change the genetic mix. It seems like same-sex reproduction, that would enable same-sex reproduction, but would it also enable something like totally anonymous reproduction? Like, could you take cells from somebody who did it, know that you were taking cells from them? Potentially, yes. That has been, that's, that has been an issue that has been written about 
in it. Yeah. That like you take like, you know, you scratch some skin off of a celebrity and go to a lab. And I mean, I mean, I think that's more of a science fiction thing, but potentially, yeah. Well, they say whatever science fiction comes up with, we can eventually do whatever you can conceive, you can crack. And then the other idea also, if you think about it, is parthenogenesis, which is, you know, in the animal world, which is the idea of self-reproduction. So say a woman wants to have a baby, she can take her egg and turn another one of her cells into a sperm cell and reproduce with herself or himself. If you think, dear listener, that egg freezing has complicated the world, just wait. (laughs) Totally. It's both wonderful and, and also has an element of hubris that you can override this, you know, the systems that help us find mates and make babies in a way that is in line with what will survive or like what's needed in the, in the world. Yeah. I have some mix. I, I notice in myself, Rachel, resistance coming up as particularly, it's interesting because I have no resistance to what my, the generation above me had resistance to, which was IVF at all. But I have resistance to the unknown technologies that are down the road. Instead of like a curiosity and an expansiveness, I have like a, whoa, 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 that's too much. You know, where's the line um, for, for human reproduction? But maybe there isn't any. Maybe that's just my fear. What's the current dialogue among scientists? There is a lot of dialogue. And I mean, and I think that among bioethicists, scientists, I think it's really important to talk about before these technologies come to be what the uses are, what the ethics around them are, what is going too far, and you know what is a, 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 an okay use of this technology. I mean, egg freezing, I think, is a wonderful technology at this point. It saves so many women's fertility. But egg freezing and then having a kid at 65 years old, uh, that's you know where, where you have to start questioning, like, is that mother too old to you know be a mother? Is it not fair to the child? to, you know, have, have a parent that old. I mean, you know, men have been doing it since the beginning of time, but so, you know, with each technology, there is going to be a whole host. There is a whole host of ethical issues. I mean, and, and also the other aspect of this that is coming up is the fact that these technologies cost money and there are, you know, it creates a a culture of, you know, reproductive haves and have nots to some extent where, you know, these very wealthy Families can afford to hire a surrogate um, or multiple egg donors and have, you know, have have a baby that way. Um, And very little of this at this point is covered by health insurance. Right. So you end up with the wealthy having more children or designer children or whatever it happens to be or more choices. You did a piece recently for Neolife on the externalized womb. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about some of those out there technologies and what's coming down the pipe and what you're excited about there. So the piece that I just published for Neolife, which is called A Womb with a View, is about um, the I, of, of the next generation of incubators. So partially because of you know poverty and poor health care, partially because women are having children older, And partially because of levels of stress, nobody really knows. The number of premature babies is going up, not down. You would think with all our advanced um, medical care that it would improve, but it's actually gotten worse. So when, you know, a baby is born prematurely, they're usually put into an incubator. And often that incubator can't support a baby that's born at like, you know, say 24 weeks or 23 weeks. And so there are a number of scientists around the world now that um, are working on artificial wombs or um, baby, you know, wombs that can support a younger premature baby. And of course, that um, technology, which is really now focused on supporting premature babies, uh, there's a lot, you know, you can extrapolate from, you know, some science fiction, some true in the future. And obviously, one of them is the idea of total ectogenesis, which is artificial wombs or, you know, what we in science fiction you know, thought, of, you know, think about, you know, that famous scene in Gat- the movie Gattaca where you see a room full of, you know, wombs growing babies. Uh, there is potential to be there in, you know, a couple of decades. Right now, the biggest challenge with um, artificial wombs is removing the umbilical cord. So um, finding a way to help babies breathe 
or creating an artificial umbilical cord that can, you know, help babies breathe. A lot of the uh, medical problems that happen with premature babies are because of the tubes and, and, and the breathing that, you know, the lack of air that they get in these, in these. So it's a more sophisticated incubator system that's also more natural. There are a bunch of prototypes. Um, some of them are being done on animals. There's one group that I wrote about in this story in the Netherlands that is actually created a robo baby um, that has a lot of the, you know, heartbeat and, and the, you know, the skin. And so they can actually test this baby in an artificial womb. And this artificial womb is set up to, you know, help with breathing, unlike, you know, help with breathing, um, gas exchange through the umbilical cord, as opposed to, you know, the, through tubes, which is what causes the problems in some, some of the incubators. There's a, another reaction I'm having to that, which is if all of the predictions on climate catastrophe and human viability on Earth and all of that stuff is true, then this seems a little bit like moonshot stuff, you know? Like that we are also creating a way that's a species survival insurance in a way. That's a sad and negative spin on it. I think that you can, you know, artificial wombs, uh, if we were talking about, I'm, we're talking about actually growing a baby from IVF or, or, or to in placing them in a womb and growing them till full term, um, which is, you know, we're, we're nowhere near that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things, you know, that you can think that it could solve, you know, the, the, the moonshot issue, the um, species survival, uh, the idea that pregnancy is still considered a disability in many ways for women. And, and so, you know, it would create gender parity if you could outsource your pregnancy um, to an artificial womb. Ooh, that, that one, that's a trigger for me. It's a trigger. Yeah. I, I think that, I think the world should adjust and honor childbearing oh, and I could, you know, that would be great. Let's do that before we like make women not have babies. I, I could not, anyway. or, or, okay. Or, or, you know, look at a woman who was born without a uterus right. or, you know, or a transgender woman who was born without a uterus. I mean, yeah. you know, these are, I, I, I agree with you. I think the ma- major issue now is creating a world um, in policy that um, creates, you know, creates an opportunity for women to, you know, be natural in their pregnancy and, you know, be able to breastfeed at, at work without being discriminated against and, you know, being able to take men and women being able to take time off from maternity leave and, you know, just generally less discrimination and a better attitude towards working mothers. Yeah, we're working. This this goes back to like the uh, almost to where we started, like whose responsibility is the child in a culture? Like if you want to raise beautiful, healthy, aware, capacious, loving young people, then we're all involved. You can't like remove their parents from the workforce and pretend the children don't in- exist. Like even during COVID, one of the side benefits of everybody being on Zoom is that you saw your coworkers in the context of their other responsibilities with their children and with their cats. A hundred percent. You know, and, and, and all of a sudden they cease to be sort of automaton, widget role players. They have this whole life they're coping with. I love that aspect. I love that too. I think it's fantastic. And I'll tell you, I, um, before, you know, we all went into lockdown, I had a client who was a very conservative company and it's, a, you know, I do, um, in addition, I have a company, in addition to being an author and a journalist, I have a company called Story Made Studio, which I do content strategy for media companies and businesses um, often, you know, helping them launch blogs and newsletters and other media products. And I was working for a company in which, you know, I was, I had produced, launched and produced the blo- their blog for them. And they, I, they sent me on a business trip over my son's spring break. And I brought my son on the trip. I thought, okay, we'll combine, well, we were going to LA and I said, oh, we'll combine my son, you know, take my son to the beach. I'll take him to the uh, LA museum, you know, and then I'll, you know, go do my meetings for this, for this company. And I actually brought one of my son to one of the, the meetings that I had thinking, why would anybody be, mind a cute seven-year-old, you know, at, at a meeting? And I, driving home from this trip, got a call from the person saying that they were really, the client that I had met with was really offended that I brought my child to the meeting. 
And I just thought, oh my God, that we live in this world that they can't, like that somebody can't adjust to a young child being in a meeting. I mean, big deal. Like we can't separate what our lives are in reality and become these like automaton workers. I mean, of course there are times that, you know, you know, where you have to be professional and it is not appropriate to have children. And, you know, I'm all for, you know, adult only situations, but clearly like I was in a situation where I was explaining, you know, that I, you know, I was on spring break. I was, I didn't have a babysitter with me. So yeah, I mean, I think that it, it's been great that the pandemic has showed our multiple roles because, you know, if women aren't good or men too, but you know, multitasking is part of life. If we can't, you know, accept that, you know, those multitasking roles and that often, you know, our kids are part of it and actually can enhance it. I mean, I, you know, I would talk to some of my coworkers and, you know, they said that having their kids around actually enhanced their work life because sometimes their kids would bring ideas or, you know, or, or humor or, you know, it's just, it's just more real. It's more natural. Yeah. In Hawaii, where I spend a large chunk of time, there's a saying that unless there are children and old people present, it's not real. Oh, I love that about Hawaii. I also, Hawaii also has a great phrase for, you know, non-genetic friends. The kids are your friends. They call them calabash, calabash cousins. Like I was just out with some friends over there and, you know, the little ones, they, they just call any adult female auntie. And you have this like sweet feeling of like, yeah, you know, that's kind of your role. You're like auntie to the world. Um, we can, believe it or not, are coming up on our 35 minutes, which is crazy. I, I could talk about this forever. Oh my God. Um, I would love if you would uh, tell people about your current book project and where they can find you. Well, the book is not out. It won't be out until 2022, fall 2022, but it's tentatively titled Reconceptions, a story of love, science, and the unfolding future of family. Um, and a lot of the pieces uh, that I'm reporting for Jane Metcalf's magazine, Neo Life, are going to be um, part of that book. And then I also um, edit a newsletter called The Art and Science of Family. And if you go on my author website, which is laymanhauptmylastname.com, um, you can sign up for The Art and Science of Family to get information about my upcoming newsletters and the um, research on the book and when the book is going to come out. Wonderful. You are a treasure. Oh, thank you. You are too. I'm really happy you reached out. Wow, right? I learned so much from Rachel. Is there a limit to what tech and science should do ethically and morally? Here, let's take a simpler question. Would you personally outsource a pregnancy and why or why not? Use the Instagram hashtag ReproTech and then tag at the.rose.woman, that's me, or at RosebudWoman, my company. And let me know. I'd love to get a conversation going. And if you love this episode and know someone who appreciate new thinking on the family, then do me a favor and pause right now and text that person the link to this show. Please subscribe and review. All of that stuff really helps to get the word out. And as always, it is my wish for you that you live in total freedom and joy in this beautiful embodiment of yours, no matter what age or stage or condition you find yourself in. May you be happy. May you be free. 